All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today I'm joined by Dr. Daniel Linford to explore the scientific case surrounding the Kalam cosmological argument, and in particular, its second premise that the universe began to exist. Dr. Daniel Linford is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He recently received his PhD in philosophy from Purdue University, boiler up. Uh, his primary research is in uh, philosophy of physics, philosophy of science more generally, and philosophy of religion. And he also co-authored with yours truly, like the greatest book that has ever been written. It's entitled <laughs> Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. His excellent dissertation, I will also add, is freely available and it's linked in the description of this video. Uh, his dissertation falls squarely within the topic of today's discussion, which is again, the scientific case for the beginning of the universe. Uh, and his dissertation is entitled Cosmic Skepticism and the Beginning of the Universe. I guess I should say, we're gonna be quote unquote responding, really just kind of discussing a video that William Lane Craig produced through his reasonable faith, uh, and it's on the scientific case for the Kalam, and in particular, its second premise. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna be just watching it and talking about it. Okay, but two shout outs before I do that. First shout out is to check out my Kalam playlist. For those interested, I will have a little banner pop up. And in particular, the two videos near the end of the playlist, in both of which Dan appears, which respond to the scientific case for the beginning of the universe in much more depth. And the second thing to check out is that uh, Dan kindly prepared various notes for the discussion that we're going to be having today. And he's also kindly making them available to the audience. So I will be linking a PDF to those notes in the description. So in addition to his dissertation, you're also going to be getting the notes that he took for this video. So everyone say thank you to Dan. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, th th that's the shout outs. But okay, I think we're ready to get into the video. Does that sound good? That sounds good. Just letting you guys know, we actually had two parts to our discussion. One was on the Kalam's causal principle, and the second was on the scientific support for the second premise of the Kalam. The video that you're watching right now is only going to be on the part dedicated to the scientific evidence for the second premise of the Kalam. And in a separate video, I'll include the discussion that we had on the causal principle. So that's something to look forward to. Okay. We're going to have to move on to the scientific case, uh, beginning with, I think, with the second law of thermodynamics, the appeal to that. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. So, I did want to pause it there. Uh, they said atheists <laughs> have typically they said atheists have typically said that the universe has existed forever. And then they play this quote, which is presumably supposed to be an instance of an atheist saying that the universe has existed forever. Now, I submit that that's not what that, that quote says. Uh, <laughs> the quote says that the universe is just there and that's all. That's entirely compatible with the universe not existing forever. So right. I, th I found that to be a very strange part of the video. I mean, I'll just say that. But the folks that were uh, in dialect with uh, Craig and, and so on, they don't think that having a finite past requires you to have a cause or a beginning. Because on their view, God has a finite past, right? They think that God, uh, independent of the universe, God is, is non-temporal, but with the universe, God is temporal. That's, that's the view that Craig has. And part of that, it's a straightforward entailment of that view that God has a finite past. And why? Because the totality of past time, Craig says, is finite. So anything that has a temporal existence must have a finite past. So God must have a finite past. If having a finite past involves having a beginning, then God would have a beginning, but they deny that. If having a finite past means that you have to have a cause, well, then God would have a cause, but they deny that too. So the idea that, uh, that having a finite past is sufficient for showing that something must either have had a cause or uh, for showing that it had a beginning is incompatible with other views that, that Craig has put forward. And, and by the way, views that, I mean, if people want to read it, I have a paper on what I call the modal condition, um, where I argue that Craig would be right to say that having a finite past does not suffice for having a beginning. I agree with Craig on that, on that point. If that point is right, then a lot of this business that we're about to talk about is just sort of a non sequitur. Yeah, I was also going to make that point, basically with respect to every single one of their scientific uh, <laughs> arguments for the finitude of the past. Again, all they're showing, at best, 
at best, uh, we're going to show, they're not actually showing, I mean, but anyway, uh, all they're showing at best is that the past is metrically finite. The, pa right. the past is metrically finite. That does not show that the universe began to exist. Because beginning to exist, as you just pointed out, doesn't just require being past metrically finite, but also not existing timelessly sans its temporal period. And furthermore, not existing prior to its metrically temporal period in a non-metric or metrically amorphous time. That is, a time for which there's no objective fact of the matter about how long it is, about its duration. If the object did exist in these ways, if it did exist timelessly sans metric time, or if it did pre-exist the beginning of metric time in a non-metric time, then the object wouldn't actually be beginning to exist at its first moment of metric time, right? Because it didn't actually arrive anew onto the scene of reality. Instead of beginning to exist, it would, as Craig puts it in one of his books, simply begin to be temporal or begin to be metrically temporal. Yeah. So that's not beginning to exist. It's not arriving anew onto the scene of reality. It's right. simply beginning to be metrically temporal. I think the precise way in which Craig puts it, which you just summarized there, is, is in fact incoherent. But I would say something slightly different. So I would say this. I'd say, if there is an aspect of something that suffices for its existence, but that aspect is non-temporal, then since things that are non-temporal do not have beginnings, then that entity couldn't have had a beginning. Um, I don't, I don't. I can't make sense of the idea that something goes from being non-temporal to being temporal. Yeah, you um, may have seen it. I raised that objection <laughs> at the very end of the discussion that I hosted between William Lane Craig and Ryan Mullen. So I raised, yeah. and I will say that I was nowhere near satisfied with his response. His response was, <laughs> "Well, we just have to." Re his response was literally, "Well, we just have to resist that intuition." Um, I, I, which, well, it seems straightforwardly contradictory. It's something. Yeah. That, in order for it to become temporal, it has to be the case that its non-temporal state passed away. Yeah, it but ceased to be. the theory of time, that just means that that state is, te is a temporal state. Yes. You're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I, but, you know, the way that I would put that 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 claim about um, having an, a, a non-temporal aspect, uh, I would say that that is best put in in modal terms. Um, this is a controversial claim. People just might disagree with me here. But the, but the idea is that if it's... Uh, if it's the case that that thing could have existed, even if time had not, so that uh, its existence doesn't require time, then we can say that there's an aspect of the thing which is non-temporal. So it's, it's, it's in terms of, uh, of counterfactuals in, in the sense that if you go to the closest world without time and you still find that entity, then it has uh, a non-temporal aspect. Um, it could be that there's a there's a world even uh, even further away where something else happens, but um, but it's about the closest worlds uh, that I and I think that that's how we can that's one way that we can cash out this idea that something has a non-temporal aspect and and that gives room for Craig right so Craig can yeah. say look even if God hadn't created time God would have existed anyway and yeah. that I think is perfectly coherent yeah exactly and. We could also put the timeless sans point almost as a conditional, like conditional on Craig's own view of being coherent. Our point is that merely from the fact that the universe has a finite past, yes, I think you can't then you can't then conclude that I, it has I a beginning because I think that's right. Yeah. But but as you know, Craig likes to come back on points like this and say that they're ad hominems, um, which is unfortunate because that has a <laughs> colloquial sense and a strict philosophical that's, sense, that's and the strict right. philosophical sense is a perfectly legitimate dialectical move, whereas the colloquial sense is a fallacy. So That's right. Uh, and and Wait, we're just using can, this. The... I, I think we can avoid both senses if we if we point out that there are good reasons uh, to affirm the view that uh, something can have a finite past without having a beginning. Um, yeah. And so, and that's that's one of the tasks that I that I take up in that in that paper, uh, yeah. explaining exactly modal... how that could be. Yeah, I'll put it in the description of modal conditions sure. at the beginning of the universe. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, before we get back to the video, the main point that we're making here, and, and tying this back to the arguments for the uh, the universe's beginning that we're assessing, the main point that we're making here is that these arguments, at best, show that the universe is past metrically finite. But that's not sufficient for showing that the past began to exist. I meant to say that's not sufficient for showing that the universe began to exist. The universe itself, or maybe some physical thing or things, may very well have, assuming Craig's view is coherent, may very well have existed timelessly sans metric time, or 
if it's not coherent, may very well have a timeless aspect in your case, or else it may have existed in a non-metric time prior to the beginning of metric time. And so we can't infer from the universe's past metrical finitude to the claim that the universe began to exist. You'd also have to rule out these alternative views that the universe, either the universe itself or at least some physical thing or things, existed timelessly sans metric time. You'd have to rule that out. You'd also have to rule out that the universe has a timeless aspect in your sense. You'd have to rule out that the universe existed in a non-metric time prior to the beginning of metric time. You would have to rule each of those out in order to infer from the past metrical finitude of the universe to the claim that the universe began to exist. And hence, in order to justify the second premise of the Glom. As far as I'm aware, none of the arguments for the second premise of the Glom succeed in doing that. <laughs> so whether the philosophical arguments Where or the scientific to, arguments. Right? I mean, it's like, I. This doesn't even, they don't seem to yeah. even ever offer responses to these. Uh, no, they just overlook the point entirely. So uh, neither the philosophical case nor the scientific case actually justify the second premise of the Kalam, that the universe began to exist, which is one of the fundamental problems for the Kalam. And I actually want to say, with respect to this timeless sans thing, doesn't, I'm pretty sure that Craig himself, in his book, God, Time, and Eternity, The Coherence of Theism, I'm pretty sure he, he himself appeals to various physical models to try to establish like the imprincipal viability of his model of God's relation to time. Yeah, so, so I, don't I, I don't know if you want to say anything he, about that. So, so Craig, uh, in, in some places, and again, I don't remember where exactly this is, um, but if you if you look at my paper on the modal condition, it's it's in there. Um, so uh, Craig says things like, well, on on singular cosmological models, um, the the singularity is I have it pulled up if you want me to read the passage from A God, Time, and Eternity. Okay, I've got it pulled up. So it's just two paragraphs. Just hear me out. Um, this is Craig speaking. Perhaps an analogy from physical time will be illuminating. In standard Big Bang cosmology, the initial cosmological singularity at which the universe, indeed space-time itself, begins is not conceived to be an instant or any other part of time, but rather to constitute a boundary to time. Thus, it cannot be said technically to be earlier than the universe, and yet it is causally prior to the universe. It is clearly distinct from a terminal cosmological singularity, which represents the terminal boundary of a universe in gravitational self-collapse. Although the physical grounds for regarding such singularities as constituting boundaries to, rather than points of, space-time are inapplicable to the notion of metaphysical time, nonetheless they do serve as an illustrative analogy to the state of God's existing sans the universe. Perhaps you could say that the envisioned state is a boundary of time which is causally, but not temporally, prior to the origin of the universe. And that's the first paragraph. The second paragraph is shorter. Or consider quantum gravitational models of the origin of the universe, such as the Hartle-Hawking or Vilenkin models. In such models, real space-time originates in a region in which time is imaginary. That is, the time variable takes on imaginary values, and so is indistinguishable from space. The timeless force space is causally prior to our real space time and is indeed usually said to have existed prior to the Planck time. And he goes on, et cetera. But anyway, that was what I wanted to quote. So I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, I mean, I think this is multiply confused uh, in part because I think it gets the physics wrong in, in ways that he himself knows better than to get wrong. Uh, so, for instance, uh, he, he has this idea, Carrie, that the, the singularity is causally prior to the universe. He's right that it's not an inst the singularity is not an instant of time. But the singularity is an open boundary. So it's an absence, right? There's no there there. So there's there's the singularity is not a thing. And so it if it's not a thing, well, there's two possibilities. Either he's saying that an absence could be conceived as a cause, in which case he'd be saying that nothingness can cause the universe to exist. <laughs> and I think he wants to avoid that conclusion. Uh, the other possibility is that um, he is somehow reifying the singularity, uh, which gets the physics weirdly wrong. Um, but then I don't understand the idea that it's not a part of the, of the universe. Um, the, these other models we was talking about, the Hawking Hartle model and the um, the other one, like the thing that so sometimes in some popularizations, there's a there's a region in those models that's presented as a timeless force space region. If you so there's a there's a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem um, for four dimensions. And what happened on so in, in the regular Pythagorean theorem, every term in the Pythagorean theorem has a positive sign on it, where you add a bunch of things together. You add up really the squares of a bunch of things together. In this four-dimensional version, the time part of it has a negative sign. 
or sometimes it's presented the other way around where the spatial part has the negative sign. Anyway, there's a difference in sign between the positive and the negative part. And because you square them, you can think of that as being a number where when you square it, you get a negative number, which we call an imaginary number, right? So the so if you, um, if you want to uh, flip the sign again, so you have positive, turn, positive signs on all of them, they need another i in there. So you can think of the, uh, then the, the time component in those models as being imaginary in some sense. But notice that the only thing that's going on, the only thing that's different relevantly different is this change in sign in this on the time variable. Now, is that a reason why Craig should think that those are timeless four space regions in those models? I don't see any reason why he would say that. Craig's view is this tense theory of time in which the time is not distinguished by space in virtue of that sign on a time variable. Uh, if you if you had other sorts of views like a B theory of time, well, again, it's not true that it's the that it's the sign on. I mean, in, in Newtonian space time, there is no such distinction in terms of the the sign, or what physicists call the signature. And so, Newtonian space time, um, it it doesn't have any such distinction. But yet, would anyone say that Newtonian space time is a timeless four space? I wouldn't think yeah. so. But, no. But uh, anyway, uh, there are there are models in which um, there's a region in the in cosmological history in which time um, in which something strange happens with time. So, for instance, in Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology, uh, time is Craig would say amorphous in one particular portion of, of cosmological history. Um, you might instead say non-metrical. The point is that in a particular part of cosmological history, there's no fact of the matter about how long a given duration of, of time is. Or the yeah, under this term. under this model, under Penrose's conformal right, cycle. Under under Penrose's model, uh, that's what that's what follows. Um, and uh, there are other there are other cosmological models we can construct that have that feature. So Penrose's model is just one example of a model that has that feature. You could think that that's a live possibility, even if you reject Penrose's model. So this doesn't yeah. depend upon accepting all the details of Penrose's model. Just to point out, we know how to build a mathematical model that has this feature of amorphous time in the early history of the universe. And uh, there are other models on which there is something non-temporal that, um, that in some sense explanatorily precedes the universe. So I think that that's true in the Hawking Hartle model, but for different reasons than than with the ones that you've just described from Craig. So the reason why I think that the uh, the Hartle Hawking model has a non-temporal structure that or non-temporal entity that precedes the temporal stuff that goes on. Non-temporal physical entity, right? Right, a non-temporal physical entity yes. is because I think that what's what's fundamental in the Hawking Hartle model indeed in many different cosmological models that physicists seriously consider is the universe's wave function. And the universe's wave function um, is in these models, I think is best interpreted as a non-temporal entity. Um, and you don't have to say uh, in those cases that that non-temporal entity somehow like precedes uh, the, the universe in the sense that um, that Craig is is discussing. Instead, it's it's somehow more fundamental than the uh, the than, than time, and somehow um, explains time. Yeah, whether through grounding or maybe functional realization or some sort of explanatory relation, or right, at least relation right. that uh, underwrites explanation. Okay, so. That was all a necessary preamble to getting into what we're about to get into, because we're just surveying various general problems that afflict the scientific case we're going to get into, and we're going to advert back to these. For instance, the illicit inference to the beginning of the universe from the mere fact that it, it's past metrically finite. So we're going to be adverting back to this discussion that we just had when we're assessing these arguments. That's just for the audience. So let's get back to the video. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. 
It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics proves that the universe has a beginning, does it? <laughs> right, so uh, several things can be said here in reply. So first, Craig knows and recognizes that in a, uh, he recognized the following fact in a variety of papers and books. The second law of thermodynamics is a mere statistical regularity and not a fundamental law. There can be violations of the second law. In fact, since the second law is only a large, a large scale statistical regularity, so in other words, it's it's a it's a pattern that's realized by very large collections of atoms. Microphysical systems violate the second law all the time. Craig should instead say that a violation of the second law as large as the entire observable universe is preposterously unlikely, right? So the so that might that might be a, a different kind of argument that he could put forward. But the the second law is not a, a necessary feature of the world, and it's not even a feature of all parts of the world that we in fact live in. Now, as as far as this kind of modified argument that I just suggested, that maybe the second law provides us some evidence for a finite past, here we can turn to um, a, a little known Catholic philosopher, theologian, and physicist from the 19th century named Caspar Eisenkrahe. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, if, if people want to look at his stuff more generally, unfortunately, not a lot of it, or, or really any of it, exists in English translation, but there's a book. Um, called uh, Entropic Creation that discusses the way in which these kinds of arguments were discussed in the, in the 19th century. Um, what Eisenkrahe points out is that an increasing function, what mathematicians call a monotonically increasing function, doesn't need to begin anywhere. Instead, it could be that the, it could be that the universe's entropy has always been increasing. Moreover, physicists have proposed that the universe might not have an equilibrium state. In that case, there is no maximum entropy for the universe to obtain, and so the universe wouldn't reach an equilibrium even if the entropy had been increasing forever. Here's a third point, or I guess a fourth point. Uh, there are live cosmological models in which there is a mechanism for restoring a large space-time region, such as the observable universe, to a low entropy state. For example, there are models in which universes are born out of black holes. But in that case, the entropy uh, that would be visible to the, the subsequent universe, the, the child universe, would be that associated with the degrees of freedom that actually fall into the black hole and not with the parent universe as a whole, right? So the parent universe may have a lot more stuff in it than is visible to the, to the child universe. And so the child universe looking back at the the bridge between the two universes would see a very low entropy or may see a very low entropy condition, even though the universe out of which they were born uh, may have much more entropy. On other models, a past universe underwent a process whereby degrees of freedom left our cosmological horizon. And in that case, the entropy visible to a subsequent universe would be very low, even though the entropy of the entire space time doesn't need to be low. Right? So and again, that's another way in which it may be that uh, there are various processes that close off portions of the universe from us and then make it appear to us as though some portion of the, of the universe is, or of the, the history of the cosmos had a very low entropy. Yeah, and again, I just want to emphasize for the audience, in order to run these criticisms, you do not have to say that these various models are in fact true. You have all, all we're saying is that for Craig to use the second law of thermodynamics to prove that the universe began to exist, he would have to rule out these alternatives. Yeah. And well, yet he and does no such just, thing. That's right. And not just rule out the particular model. So for instance, the you know, the model that I discuss in my paper on this topic, uh, in which the um, in which degrees of freedom go out of the, the cosmological horizon um, is the model that's discussed there is ekpyrotic cosmology, but uh, 
you don't have to endorse ekpyrotic cosmology to endorse this feature of ekpyrotic cosmology, yeah. right? And likewise, in order for Craig to say that, uh, in order to rule out this possibility as, as a live possibility, Craig, it's not, su it's not sufficient for Craig to say that ekpyrotic cosmology is various kinds of problems. That I'm very happy to admit. The, what Craig needs to do is to show that no model with this feature, even a model we haven't thought of, is a live possibility, right? I mean, all that ekpyrotic cosmology does is provide an example of a model where that's the case. It doesn't, it's not the only way that that could be the case. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also a point to make, like, isn't it the case that each of the fleshed out models within physics have various problems afflicting them? That's why we don't have a consensus, even for the ones yeah, that right. involve a finite but, past. And it, gets, and it gets worse than that, because yeah, even the ones are, that involve a finite past. I just want to emphasize that for the audience. Yeah, so so a lot of, uh, of non-physicists or um, people who aren't aware of how these things work technically may not be aware of... Uh, what's called a how possibly explanation. Um, I mean, physicists don't use that language, philosophers of biology do, but I think there's a very similar concept in, in physics. So often when physicists propose a cosmological model, what they're what they're doing is, is they're showing, they're providing one example uh, of how the universe might have a particular feature, how it could possibly have that feature. It's not an ex it's not a model that's that's meant to show. Uh, that you know that this is definitely the way that things were. The language that physicists use here, by the way, is a, is a toy model. Um, it's it's meant to represent some particular principle. Uh, there's something analogous in biology where someone might say, "Well, it seems like this particular feature couldn't have possibly evolved." And then the appropriate response from a biologist is to say, "Look, I don't know how it actually did, but here is a way that th that it could have gone." And, and that's enough to show that it's at least possible for it to evolve. There may be other mechanisms, you know, maybe other pathways by which that particular feature uh, evolved. And, and likewise, physicists do the same thing. Someone comes along and says, look, I have this mathematical result. It seems to preclude uh, something that we thought was true about the universe. So that thing can't possibly be true. What is the response that someone has? It's to say, well, here's a toy model where the universe would have that feature. Um, and that's just to show that this mathematical result that you think has this consequence of ruling something out doesn't, in fact, rule that thing out. Yeah. And in addition to all these problems for the sec appeal to a second law of thermodynamics in support of the Coulomb second premise, there is the problem that we mentioned at the outset, which is that even if these problems were totally surmountable, the argument at best would show that the universe has, uh, is past metrically finite. Okay, that's not sufficient for showing that it began to exist. So even setting aside all these problems that we've been examining, there is still this fundamental problem afflicting the appeal to the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so is that good? Should we move on to the redshift in Big Bang cosmology? Yes. Yeah, I have a okay. lot to say about that, as you might imagine. Okay, sweet. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. I mean, almost beyond comprehension, because that's not what they discovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, so the first thing that they said um, was that the, the result from the second law of the dynamics is further concerned, uh, further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. Uh, that itself wasn't true and for two reasons. So first, according to a mathematical result first conjectured by David Malament in the 1970s, more recently proved by J.B. Manchak, a uh, result that I call the, uh, the malament manchak theorem, or theorems really because it's a class of theorems. In a broad class of space-times, no observer 
can ever gather sufficient data to determine the global features of the space time that they inhabit. And a corollary of the mailman manchek theorem is that no observer can gather sufficient data to determine that they inhabit a space time with a global past boundary. And second, when we look into our universe's past, we run, into, we run into what is sometimes called the physics horizon. That is, we run into a regime where the relevant physics goes beyond what we can say about the world. Uh, this is particularly so if we take singularity seriously. As we turn back the clock, we encounter regimes where the energy density and temperature outrun any finite value. We ought to think that our scientific theories are only applicable with some fi within some finite domain. I don't care where you put the boundary of that domain. So long as there is some finite boundary or other, we are guaranteed to exceed it as we turn the clock back. That is, if you take singularity seriously. And for that reason, we ought to say that we have no idea what was happening in that portion of cosmological history. Additionally, we know that there is some energy scale at which quantum gravity effects will begin to dominate. Since we do not get possessed a quantum gravity theory, we cannot say what was going on in that period of cosmological history. So then the video went on to make the claim that the redshift data alone was somehow sufficient to conclude that the universe began from a single point in the finite past. Now, the redshift data does not in itself suffice for this conclusion. Importantly, the redshift data tells us at most that the observable universe is expanding and has been expanding for some time. But some of the earliest proponents of Big Bang cosmology, such as George Gamow, thought that the universe was contracting before it was expanding. Note, too, that the redshift data does not pose any sort of problem for the malman manchak theorems. There may be a very large uh, space-time region that is expanding, but that isn't sufficient for concluding that space-time as a whole is expanding. Now, when the redshift data was first produced, Hubble and Slifer were themselves skeptical of Big Bang cosmology. Here's what the redshift data actually tells us. It tells us that there's an inverse correlation between the redshift and the observed spectra of, di of distant galaxies and their apparent luminosity, right? In other words, when we look at galaxies, we, sh we see that the light from them is shifted into the red and the degree to which they're shifted into the, into the red is a function of how bright they appear to us, right? That's their apparent luminosity. Now, if we interpret the apparent luminosity as a measure of distance, Right? We do that because if a galaxy is further away, it should be dimmer. Then we can say that the further galaxies are away from us, the more the light from them is redshifted. But that, again, isn't, that, that's, that's not yet enough to say that the universe is expanding. If we take the redshift data together with a realistic interpretation of general relativity or perhaps some appropriately similar theory, then we can use the redshift data to calculate the, rel the relative speed at which distant galaxies are receding from us, and that would allow us to say that the universe is expanding. But without a realistic interpretation of general relativity or an appropriately similar theory, we cannot make the inference that galaxies are receding from us. Right? The redshift in their light alone doesn't tell us that. It's only when the data is interpreted in light of a theory that it tells us that. For example, Slifer proposed an, an alternative uh, explanation called the tired light hypothesis. According to the tired light hypothesis, the light from distant galaxies appears redshifted because light loses energy as it moves through space. And so it shifts in frequency. And so when it travels from us from distant galaxies, it's lost enough light, he thought, that, it sh that the light shifts into the red, even though the galaxies, he thought, were basically static. Nowadays, virtually no one, including us, thinks that, the that Slifer's tired light hypothesis is true. But our point is that the redshift data can be provided an alternative explanation, and that in order to infer that the universe's expansion, uh, in order to infer the universe's expansion, we need a realistic interpretation of a, subs of a substantive physical theory. And here is the problem for Craig. Craig rejects a realistic interpretation of general relativity in favor of an instrumental interpretation, and then fails to offer anything substantive in its place. For example, Craig tells us that instead of interpreting gravity as the curvature of space-time, he interprets gravity as a physical force. But then Craig fails to provide any sort of substance of physical theory to put in place of general relativity, and that would allow us to calculate the relationship between redshifts and recessional velocities. Hence, Craig hasn't told us how he is able to use the redshift data to calculate the recessional velocities of distant galaxies. On what grounds, then, can Craig say that the universe is expanding in the first place? 
And to be clear, we are not denying that there is excellent evidence for the expansion of the observable universe. I think the universe is expanding. Instead, we are saying that our cosmological data must be interpreted in light of a substance of physical theory. By rejecting a realistic interpretation of the physical theory in light of which our cosmological data are most often interpreted, and failing to replace a physical theory by another substance of physical theory that has similar consequences, Craig has failed to explain why he what, should think the redshift data is good evidence for the universe's expansion. A lot that could be added. I mean, one thing that I just want to say, again, adverting to our discussion earlier, is that even if we set aside all of your problems, even if Craig could get bulletproof, irrefutable, demonstrative proof that you are totally wrong in everything you just said. <laughs> His argument still doesn't show the second premise of the Kalam. Why is that? Well, because, again, this point about redshift and so on would only show at best that our local spatiotemporal manifold has is pastometrically finite. Does, right. That doesn't imply that it began to exist, again, adverting to the same point from earlier. There's something important that's related to that, and also related to what I just, you know, the, the big thing I just went through, which is that... Uh, in order to draw metaphysical conclusions out of a scientific theory, the standard sort of thought is that you need a realistic interpretation of that theory. Otherwise, the theory doesn't have metaphysical import. Well, if you if you then have an instrumental or, or non-realistic interpretation of a theory like general relativity, you're not going to get metaphysics out of it. So in order for Craig to make the relevant sort of response to the objection that you just made, Right. And if, if Craig were to turn around and, 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 and say, uh, look, we can appeal to this scientific theory in order to show that the, the universe has the relevant sort of features to have a beginning. Well, the only way that he can ever say something like that is if he offers us a realistic interpretation of some physical theory or other and gives us good reason to accept that interpretation. So as, insofar as he uh, denies a realistic interpretation of relativity and fails to put something relevant in its place, there's there's no way he's going to be able to like appeal to science to be able to show that this that science has the relevant sort of implication. Yeah. So let's get on to the uh, the point that basically these models on which the past isn't finite have been proposed and have like been successive failures. So, so let's get on to that point. Uh, not everyone is fond of a finite universe. So it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. All right, so what do you make of that point? Right, so the claim here is that there's a series of alternatives to Big Bang cosmology that are proposed, but uh, one by one, those models were refuted. Uh, so I just I wonder why this has any relevance whatsoever. I think the second premise of the Kalam argument cannot be adequately supported on the basis of physical cosmology. And my uh, my support for that view draws upon the mailman magic theorems and the so-called physics horizon. It doesn't matter to me in the slightest that some past proposed alternatives to singular Big, Big Bang cosmology have been ruled out when, first, we do not have good reason to think that singular Big Bang cosmology is correct. Second, we do have good reason to think that singular Big Bang cosmology is incorrect. So it, like the fact that various alternatives have been ruled out, um, well, fine, I, I don't care about that. Yeah, and I did notice the last little thing that they showed on the screen there was quantum gravity, but it didn't fall over. Does that mean that they re still regard that as a live option? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't, that's, that's very confusing. There was also one of them was eternal inflation and that's still a live model, I, you know, so the, and by the way, we, we know, as a matter of fact, that there must be a quantum gravity theory. Um, and, I'll t and I'll tell you why we know that. We know that because we know that there's such things as neutron stars. And inside of neutron stars um, is, a, is a high gravity environment and also an environment in which quantum mechanical effects become important. Um, whatever the hell it is that's going on inside of neutron stars, uh, quantum gravity is in some way relevant. So you, like, it, it, it doesn't make sense to say uh, that we've ruled out quantum gravity models. Um, we also know yeah. that it has to be relevant in some way to the early universe, because if you do think that the universe was hot and dense, well, we, we know we have a fairly good idea of the energy scales at which quantum gravity becomes relevant. And as I was saying, um, you're going to run into those energy scales somewhere in the early universe. Yeah, and also, I mean, again, I just 
bear repeating for the audience, some at least some of the models that they show it as falling by the wayside are actually still physically live options that are still on the table within contemporary physics. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, now we're getting on to the uh, borda guth vilenkin theorem, and this one will be fun. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so let's, let's get on to that. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin, prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any ad adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. Well, so first, uh, the video misstates the, the BGV theorem. Um, the BVG theorem states that if space-time is expanding at average along a trajectory through space-time, then that trajectory uh, only has finite extension to the past. To obtain a result closer to the video summary, we can consider a space-time region as a bundle of all of the trajectories that could pass through that region. And then we can say that a region which is expanding on average could not have been expanding forever. We can then try to apply the BGV theorem to the entire universe by thinking of the entire universe as a big space-time region. Now, one of the things that's uh, so there's a few different ways in which that may not be relevant. One is that if this has anything to do with the universe having a finite past, as we have repeatedly pointed out, that wouldn't suffice for showing that the universe had a beginning. The other way in which uh, this may not be relevant is that the, or one other way in which it may not be relevant is that the BGB theorem tells us about the spatial temporal extent of an expanding region or region that's expanding on average it doesn't tell us either what's happening outside of that region or uh, whether there's nothing at all that precedes that region. Now, one of the really important points here is that while Craig may have his favorite theorem, so his favorite theorem seems to be the BBG theorem, I have a favorite theorem of my own. Importantly, the BBG theorem cannot evade the mailman manchak theorem. So while it may be true that if space-time as a whole is always expanding on average, the mailman manchak theorem suggests that we could never know it. And so we could never know that the BGV theorem actually applies to the universe we inhabit. Now, sometimes uh, Craig says things that suggest that when people put forward notions like this, that they are uh, objecting to the BBG theorem. Well, the BBG theorem is a mathematical result. You can't, there's, it's a mathematical theorem. There's no such thing as objecting to it, the proof forward is valid. The only issue is whether or not the theorem is A, correctly stated, and B, uh, whether the theorem actually applies to the universe that we live in. If, it, if it's inapplicable to our universe, then who cares? And what the mailman manchak theorem suggests is that even if the BBG theorem does apply to our universe, that's not something we could ever know. One last bit. So, uh, the BBG theorem requires us to commit to a substantive physical theory concerning space-time. Craig frequently points out that the BBG theorem does not require that space-time satisfies the Einstein field equations, and so does not require general relativity. And he's right about that. The BBG theorem is a geometrical result that goes beyond general relativity. But the BBG theorem is not a result that holds for any space-time theory whatsoever. For example, if space, time, if space, time, or space time are discrete, as suggested in some proposals for quantum gravity theories, such as causal th set theory or loop quantum gravity, or in some metaphysical theories, then the BBG theorem is inapplicable. You might think, for example, that the, the best way to make sense of a tense theory of time, of temporal passage, is if time is discrete, is if one moment of time passes into existence and then another. But if that's the right way to understand the passage of time, and if time really does pass, well, then time is discrete, and the BBG theorem doesn't apply to the universe that we inhabit. Moreover, the BBG theorem requires that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Craig holds for an alternative to special relativity called Neo-Lorentzianism. While Neo-Lorentzianism is compatible with the view that nothing can go faster than light, Neo-Lorentzianism certainly doesn't require that nothing can go faster than light. Ergo, given Neo-Lorentzianism, we do not have good reason to endorse 
the BBG theorem. And lastly, the BBG theorem requires that there is no prior cosmological epoch during which space-time was contracting. While Craig may be able to point out some deficiencies in some of the cosmologies that have been proposed and that include a contraction epoch, that's distinct from making the positive inference that there was no contraction epoch. We don't shoulder the, the burden of ruling in any such epoch with an explicit model. Instead, Craig has the, the burden of ruling out the live possibility of such an epoch. Yeah, um, I know a point that Felipe Leone and I've seen others make is just that, and I mean, this is kind of highlighted by all of what you've been saying, but like, there currently seems to be no scientific consensus about whether the borda guthvelenkin theorem has the implication that all physical reality had an absolute temporal beginning, in which case it's epistemically prudent to suspend judgment about the matter. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because there are some, um, there are some theologians who, or some religious thinkers who, who have made statements that are actually quite close to the kind of statement that I would want to make. So they say things like, well, when we, when we trace the world back to its conception, we're encountered with the deepest of all mysteries. Right. But that's exactly <laughs> why we can't make an inference as to what, as to whether or not the universe had a beginning. Which is your thesis of cosmic skepticism that you defend at length in your dissertation, which is linked in the description. Okay. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So uh, let's get back to the video. And I think this is uh, coming close to the end of it where they talk about the properties of the cause of the universe, which is uh, never fun for me, but let's go on. <laughs> it's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and unimaginably powerful, much like God. Let's just go through each of these individually and see whether or not we can infer them from <laughs> the fact that the universe has a cause. So, so let's go through these. Uh, spaceless. I say no. Uh, in my view, all we've shown, or at least all that Craig has shown within his first two premises, at best, at best, is that our local spatiotemporal manifold began to exist. Okay, I'm granting him the inference from past metrical finitude yeah, to beginning right. to exist. I'll grant him that. I'll spot him that. All this means is that the cause of that spatiotemporal manifold cannot exist within the spatial framework of our local spatiotemporal manifold. That is the self-contained one that began to expand around 13.8 billion years ago. But there may be a different space that exists causally prior to the beginning of our local spatiotemporal manifold and in which the cause thereof resides. This space may be the same sort of space as our local spatiotemporal manifold space. It might be like three-dimensional, or it may be some more exotic state space that various philosophers have proposed for the location of the universal wave function, or it may be some higher dimensional spatial framework, and so on. The epistemic possibilities are boundless. And Craig, in claiming that the cause must be spaceless, illegitimately assumes that none of these are the case. Right. So the crucial point is that they straightforwardly undercut the claim that the cause of our local spatial temporal manifold must be spaceless. That is without any space whatsoever. Yeah, I think. So, yeah, this, I mean, I'll just I'll turn it over to you. So, I mean, I didn't take notes on this part, but I, I think a part of what's going on is, is a kind of illicit faith in some of our mathematical models, which is ironic, given that Craig otherwise doesn't want to do that. But the in, in some general relativistic models, namely the, the ones that have a Big Bang singularity, uh, you can't extend the space-time manifold past the, the open boundary, past the singularity. Um, and in that sense, you might think, oh, the space-time manifold comes to an end. And by the way, I say come, come to an end because we're like looking you know, backwards through, through time. And so we encounter this boundary from that backwards looking perspective, it's an end or a beginning from the forwards looking perspective. Uh, but that's not to say, you know, just because the mathematical model happens to have that feature doesn't mean that reality has that feature. Um, the other thing to be said here is that it sometimes gets confusing because of all the different ways that the word universe is used. So if the universe is the totality of all physical entities, uh, well, then I don't, I don't see how Big Bang cosmology tells us anything about 
that. Um, and that's sort of what you touched on when you talked about uh, both the idea that there could be some like other kind of space um, and also uh, something more exotic that perhaps is beyond space time. But I think it's an important point for the viewer because the viewer might think, well, if, if, if the word universe means the totality of physical reality, well, then how could there be a, like a physical space beyond space time or, or yeah. something more exotic beyond uh, and it, it, the, uh, or sorry, beyond the universe, right? So beyond the totality of physical entities, there couldn't be a physical entity beyond those. But the term universe has these multiple meanings, and it's only when you equivocate on that, on that meaning, um, that we can make the kind of inference that Craig wants to make here. Yeah. Well. Okay. So. I just want to hammer this point home. If that's how we are understanding universe as the totality of physical reality, if that's how we're understanding it and not our local spatiotemporal manifold, then that second premise is criminally unjustified. The second premise that the universe began to exist. You can give me any philosophical argument you want for the finitude of the past. Still, that won't show that the totality of all physical reality began to exist because maybe there is a non-temporal physical object. Or maybe the object it has a non-temporal aspect, or maybe it pre-exists the beginning of metric time and a non-metric time, etc. It will still be physical, and so it'll be part of all physical reality, and so the universe under this sort of case would not begin to exist. Likewise, you can give me any of these scientific arguments for the finitude of the past, and all those scientific arguments, as I've been explaining throughout this whole thing, those only show at best that like our local spatio-temporal manifold began to expand 13.8 billion years ago. That doesn't show that the totality of all physical reality began to exist. It's, it's actually it's a, it's a really interesting feature, relativistic space-time, that uh, it introduces the possibility of horizons. And so people might be familiar, for instance, uh, with the idea that nothing can tr uh, travel faster than light. But what that one of the implications of that is that you can't receive signals from locations that are sufficiently far away. There's, there's some complications with general relativity because as light is traveling to us, space is also expanding. And so in fact, you can see further away than you might have naively expected. But nonetheless, there are places where you just won't receive a signal from. And you know, one of the other things that's, that's here is that the since the universe is expanding, uh, the, the rate at which the universe is expanding away from us increases with distance if you go far enough away then the universe relative to us is expanding so rapidly that the light from those regions will never reach us the other I mean the other kind of uh, horizon that relativity introduces is the kind of event horizon you've around black holes but it's sort of the same story where you have a region of space-time that outside observers will never be privy to and so it's, it's a general consequence of the advent of relativistic cosmology that vast portions of our universe are outside of our epistemic scope. We will never receive signals from them. And so if you're worried about, like, if you're trying to think about what can we know about the totality of physical reality, well, to make general statements about that, I mean, it seems like the precisely kind of thing that uh, relativistic cosmology in particular throws into question. But as you're saying, like, there are independent questions and in, independent reasons to question it as well. Yeah. So, okay. So properties of the cause, we just went through spaceless. Nope. Doesn't follow. Okay. What about, <laughs> what about timeless? I say, no, it doesn't follow. Even if it causes the beginning of metric time, it still may exist in a non-metric time. Again, for the audience, a non-metric time is a time for which there is no objective fact of the matter concerning its length or its duration. Right. Uh, so it's kind of like amorphous in that matter. So it's not infinitely long into the past. That would introduce metrication. <laughs> that gives it an objective fact of the matter about how long it is. And uh, for the audience, they can check out Richard Swinburne's work, Alan Paget's work, Ryan Mullen's work. It's, this has been discussed in all their works. And as you said, non-metric time appears in physically live models, including yeah. Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology. The <laughs> other complication that physics introduces here, so all these philosophers are typically assuming that there's one metric for time. But what if that wasn't true? So there are physical theories that uh, introduce things like bimetric time. So the idea of bimetric time is that you see of one space-time manifold, right? And, what, and, and how distances work on a space-time manifold is you pick out, for example, two points in the manifold, and then you ask, what is the distance between them? And the assumption that there's only one metric is the assumption that there's a unique answer for what that distance is. 
But what if that weren't so? What if, what if there were, uh, what if between any two points, there were two or more distances? Uh, well, in that case, if that's a live possibility, and you say that past metric time is finite, you need to say with respect to what which metric. And if there's some metric that we don't have epistemic access to, like for example, as Craig thinks, if there's uh, if there's absolute metaphysical time that's independent of physical time, well, then it, it could be that the uh, metaphysical time, even if it's metricated, might have a different duration than than uh, physical time. Um, and in that case, uh, any of these arguments about the, the finitude of past physical time wouldn't tell you whether past metaphysical time or whatever other time you want, whether it was finite. Yeah, that's a point Dr. Felipe Leone makes in some of his papers, which I think is an excellent point. It's that uh, if we're just appealing to the scientific case for the finitude of the past, that leaves entirely open whether or not there's a metaphysical time that pre-exists the beginning of physical time. Right. So, well, so yeah, even I like the purely scientific case where we have live, like I was saying, we have live physical hypotheses on which there's more than there's more than one metric. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So uh, t uh, spaceless, no, doesn't follow. Timeless, no, doesn't follow. What about immaterial? Well, uh, as I say, this kind of depends on what we mean by uh, material and immaterial. In principle, what I say is that the cause, at least of our local spatiotemporal manifold, assuming that it has a cause and assuming that our local spatiotemporal manifold be began, etc., what I say is that it could very easily be physical. That is, the cause could very well be physical, in the sense of, for instance, accurately described by ideal physics or something like that. Consider, for example, the non spatiotemporal universal wave function of Alyssa Ney and Jill North and Julian Barber, etc., that you and I talk about in chapter eight of our book, right? <laughs> There doesn't appear to be anything wrong in principle with a timeless physical thing. And we've been talking about like live models on which there are such things throughout this discussion. So just because even there's like a time, let's suppose that it's a timeless cause, we still can't infer that it's non-physical. Right. Uh, so so that's that's what I want to say with respect I mean, to this. Maybe material. immaterial. I mean, it depends on how you define yeah. material. And... Which I, I don't really know how. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so for the, what I think what is definitely true is that the way in which uh, historical philosophers, the like philosophers from the ancient Greeks or the early moderns or whatever, the way that they conceived of material is not the way that we conceive of the physical now. And so if if that's what matter is supposed to be, if matter is supposed to be like agglomerations of atoms or something, um, well, we already know that the fundamental stuff is not like that. Yeah. And so the so the, there may be entirely distinct reasons to reject materialism without rejecting physicalism. Yeah, and I do want to say, I mean, that's, then, if, if that's where we're going, then establishing the immateriality of the first cause is kind of a hollow victory, because you're still leaving it open whether it's physical. <laughs> right? It still leaves open but whether it's physical. I think it's an important point, because... Yeah. The, I mean, hollow uh, victory for the theist, right? I mean, it's not like some immaterial <laughs> ghostly thing, like God, like... Uh... Right, right. What, one of the ways in which it's, a, it's an important thing to point out is that our physical theories have changed radically over time so radically from the early modern period that at least we can say that the way that the early moderns conceived of matter is not something that we believe in now. The way, that Aristotle believed, the way what Aristotle thought matter was is not something that anyone should believe in now. Uh, likewise, our present physical theories may well change in the future, and it may be that physical stuff has some, old, has some wholly unexpected collection of, of properties um, that will be captured in some future physical theory. And so to say that, I mean, what, what Craig would need to do here is to give us uh, enough of an account of what the final physical theory would be in order to say that the cause of the, of the universe couldn't be anything like that. And I just, I have no idea, what, how would you do that? <laughs> well, you just sit in your armchair and you just intuit the fundamental nature of reality. <laughs> you just yeah, have these... For who has that ever worked in the past, right? Like... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a good question. Um, okay. <laughs> well, okay. So, again, we're going through these properties. There are only two more left. Uh, I just want to, again, keep our little... Um, 
bookkeeping device. Firstly, spaceless, nope, doesn't follow. Secondly, timeless, nope, doesn't follow. Thirdly, immaterial, there's a little asterisk on that one. Does it follow? Eh, it kind of depends on what we mean by immaterial. Certainly doesn't follow that it's non-physical, which is what they really want to, to, right. to show, because that gets us to kind of denial of physicalism. There's this seemingly transcendent cause of the universe, but they don't even get to non-physical. Okay, so none of those follow. What about uncaused? This one, I think, is interesting, because notice that nothing in the video shows that the cause must be uncaused. Like, it may, may, may very well have a cause. Like, indeed, for all the video shows, there may be an infinitely descending chain of timeless yeah, realities right. causally sustaining the other timeless realities. Well, so there's, one, there's something strange at the beginning of the video. Because they don't say in the video that they're presenting the Kalam argument. They say that they're presenting the cosmological argument. Yeah. Which I'm willing to forgive what they mean to the Kalam argument, maybe, but uh, which, which is a particular kind of cosmological argument. One of the things that's particularly important about the Kalam argument, as opposed to some other cosmological arguments, is that the, the Kalam argument is just not an argument for a first cause. So it, it, it just, that's not among the things that it could establish. But even if it could establish that, as someone who is open to the possibility that there are, uh, for example, necessary non-causal connections, I don't understand why it should trouble me in the slightest that there are that there could be a first a first cause. I, that um, you know maybe that thing has a more fundamental non causal explanation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, let, let's just step back. Let's think about the two premises of the Kalam. Okay, one is that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Okay, that's compatible with something which doesn't beginning to exist also having a cause, right? So, e like, maybe there's a cause of the universe, and maybe it's timeless, and so maybe it doesn't begin to exist. But it still may very well have a cause, right? So the first premise right. is entirely compatible with the cause of the universe also having a cause, that's okay? Right. So, so what about the second premise? The universe began to exist. Well, that's still, that's obviously compatible with the cause of the universe itself having a cause. <laughs> and so, yeah, well, the the two premises, forward, I mean, suppose that God created an angel, and then an angel created the universe, well, in that case, the universe had a cause, but the cause of the universe was not the first cause. Yeah, exactly. And so nothing in the Kalam as such, the two premises, together with the conclusion, none of that gets us to the cause of the universe being uncaused. Now, I will grant that if we, if we go along with certain elements of their defense of the second premise, for instance, causal finitism, Okay, fine. Then plausibly you're going to get to a first cause. But my point is just that nothing in the video, right? and also nothing in the Kalam as such, as stated, right? neither of those entail that the cause of the universe must be uncaused. And so I stand by my claim that that is also an illicit inference within this context. I think that's <laughs> so, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm adding that to the list of things that don't follow. Uh, so that right. uh, we're keeping. And for more on whether causal finitism might be true, see Joe's other video. On that <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> see my Kalam playlist as well as like my 13 papers under review that the reviewers are sitting on for like almost a year now. Now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Someone out there, get to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so spaceless doesn't follow. Timeless doesn't follow. Immaterial, we've got an asterisk with a note that non physical doesn't follow. Uncaused doesn't follow. What about unimaginably powerful. This one is baffling to me. Uh, how are you supposed to infer how powerful the cause is? All we're able to infer is that it's sufficiently powerful to kickstart our local spatiotemporal manifold. Right. Where are you getting that it's enormously or unimaginably powerful from that? Well, we, we already know. That the only thing that it can do. <laughs> yeah, but what if that's the only thing that it could do? I mean, <laughs> what I want to say is we already know that very slight changes in initial causal conditions can have massive downstream effects. So very plausibly, causes don't need to be unimaginably powerful to produce very large, seemingly huge, very powerful effects. And so that seems to undercut the inference to the unimaginable powerfulness of this first cause. Why? Why, why, why? Why think it's unimaginably powerful? Why think it's enormously powerful? As far as I've seen in this, on this front, this is pure assertion. Uh, from from Craig, and it's undercut by my lights by this well-known feature of causal chains that, namely, that very not enormously powerful well, initial perturbations can ever result in huge effects. And it's also there's something really peculiar about the argument because the so they're not trying to infer 
uh, like Craig and his friends are, are not trying to infer that the universe had a powerful cause. I mean, they, they, that is like part of what they're trying to infer. It follows from what they're trying to infer. But what they're actually trying to infer is that the cause of the, the universe is omnipotent. Yeah. Right? Like, I, so the, and one of the things I point out in my dissertation is that, I mean, suppose you had some putative, some entity that you knew had caused some series of, of things, and you were wondering, is this entity omnipotent? <laughs> uh, yeah. And now, you, know, you, you could uh, make some kind of inductive generalization. You could say, well, it caused these set of things. So uh, we, we make the inference that for, for every possible task, it can also do that task. I mean, just as like, you know, someone might make the inductive inference that for all future mornings, the sun will rise just as we've seen those sunrise in the past. But the problem with this kind of inference is that, so if you take up the kind of uh, account of intrinsic probability that someone like Paul Draper takes up, in which uh, intrinsic probability is going to be determined by the, um, the modesty and the coherence of a hypothesis, and that's all. Um, well, notice that while it might be um, so if, if you think, if you believe in induction, then you, you may say that it's a really coherent hypothesis to say that uh, this entity can do all possible tasks, given that it can do some observed set of tasks. But it's also maximally immodest, it's <laughs> as immodest as it could possibly be, right? So the, like, I, I don't know how we get to the conclusion that the cause of the universe is omnipotent merely from the the claim that the the cause of the of the universe was able to cause the universe um even if you might imagine that that gives you some license to think that it could cause maybe some other things um i mean i, I don't i'm not sure that that even follows given what i said a moment ago about there's the possibility that the cause of the universe only could cause the universe and nothing else yeah. but um but but imagine you know giving them uh, some leeway here it, it still doesn't i still don't see why uh we would we would reach omnipotence and then what they say in the remainder of the video is that given that the cause of the universe has the set of features that they've identified <laughs> it's reasonable to believe in god well is that really true given that it's you know the, the inference we're not able to make an inference here that the cause is omnipotent but unless the cause is omnipotent, you can't make the inference that it's God, at least not God as they define God. So there's, I, I, I don't, uh, and by the way, there's something else that's really strange here. Maybe I'm mistaken in this, but did they say anything about mental attributes? No, neither mental nor moral. So what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean. Uh, this is something that I very often identify with a number of theistic arguments, which is just a paucity of imagination. Like, you'll get to a necessary being, and again, this is not true of all theists, but oftentimes, at least in the apologetic sphere, you'll be like, then they'll just like immediately go to God, where it's like, oh, it's like non-spatial temporal universal wave function, Neoplatonic one that Plotinus believed in, uh, impersonal Brahman, uh, <laughs> the Tao, yeah. uh, <laughs> etc. <mean, look>, <laughs> So the if if by universe we mean the observable universe, like the largest portion of physical reality that we can observe, well, here's a hypothesis: that spatiotemporal region uh, was brought into existence by an inflaton field. Um, that's a hypothesis taken seriously in contemporary physical cosmology. It's one according to which um, it's a it's a it's a consequence of this particular physical field that will produce a large uh, spatiotemporal region of precisely the kind that we observe. Um, but no one, I mean, in other words, it has a bunch of the features that we just talked about. And you may even say that it's it's it, timeless and spaceless in a, uh, in, a, in a sense in that it's uh, grounded in the universal wave function. If that's right, then the we have a cause of the universe that satisfies all of the criteria that they have identified, but which none of them would want to call God. Yes, and that's in addition to the fact that almost none of these criteria actually follow, as we've argued. So, like, you don't get to spaceless, you don't get to timeless, 
Immaterial has a little asterisk, and you don't get to non-physical. You don't get to uncaused. You don't get to unimaginably powerful. But even if you did get to all those, you don't then get to get, go to God. Right. So it's like... It's like the gap problem in spades. Yeah, well, it's like the gap problem on, like, multiple steroids being injected into, like, multiple veins at once. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Which is one reason... I mean, which is one reason why... Well, I don't know. I was just going to say... I mean, it's one reason why I don't quite get why many apologists think the Kalam is so overwhelmingly powerful. To me, it's it's interesting and fun to think about. And it's fascinating and has potentially interesting ramifications about the structure of cosmological reality and its potential origins. But it just get, doesn't get us anywhere near God. And it's just, that's right. kind of how I see it. Well, this is, this is something I say in the beginning of the outside of dissertation, that there's, there's a much more interesting set of questions here. So the first stage of the, what's often called the first stage of the Kalam argument, which I often just call the Kalam argument, does not mention God anywhere. And I think that it drives a really interesting philosophical research program. On the one hand, we want to know what the what the scope and grounds of causation are, whether it makes sense to talk about causal explanations that transcend the uh, physical reality, or if causation is a particular physical phenomenon that has to be grounded in some way in physical reality. And the other, uh, the other research question that it drives is a question about whether we can, what, what if anything we can know about the totality of physical reality? What is the, how should we think about the epistemology of cosmology? And that set of, of questions delivers us a really interesting, really worthwhile research program that unfortunately it seems to be taken up almost exclusively by uh, a, a, a group of, of theists who have a very particular kind of theological agenda. But I want to suggest that this is a set of questions that philosophers should be interested in more generally and that should be of interest to both metaphysicians and philosophers of science. Exactly. And I found precisely that when looking at and doing extensive research on Benedetti paradoxes like the Grimipa paradox and so on. Yeah. I've learned a lot about just the, the nature of paradoxes and the way they work and ways to solve them. Certain revisionary solutions, certain conservative solutions, and so on. And like the weighing up different costs and benefits of them. And just the potential metaphysical ramifications or lack thereof of Benedetti paradoxes, like the structure of space, the structure of time, the structure of causal chains, and so on. So it's just endlessly fascinating uh, how so many different areas of philosophy intersect with the Kalam. Uh, and it's like unfortunate that, I don't know, it's unfortunate that it's like, very much just being talked about in philosophy of religion when there are lots of these ramifications and connections with other domains. Absolutely, yeah. The, the Kalam argument itself was discussed by Kant. I, it, so it has this deep and rich history in, in philosophy. And so it's it's weird that it's been like diverted into this little uh, like ghetto of philosophical interest. But, <laughs> yeah, this little yeah. weapon to like bonk people over the heads with at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for coming on. Um, any last words for the audience uh, to, to round out our discussion? I mean, I just want to say, like, I, I think people who are interested in these issues should continue investigating them. I, I think uh, people who are interested in these things should take um, the science quite seriously. Uh, luckily, we now live in a time where it's um, even even the technical parts of the science are really quite accessible. So Sean Carroll, for instance, recently wrote a book. Um, I don't remember the name of it offhand, but it's his most recent book. And it, and it presents general relativity, among other topics, both at a level of uh, mathematical sophistication, uh, but also in terms of that lay audiences can understand. There's also Leonard Susskind's Theoretical Minimum series. Uh, Z, just Z is his name, so it's Z-E-E, -E, just came out of a, a book on um, quantum field theory. Uh, I, I think... Uh, I think we, we're living in this sort of really nice moment where non-experts who want to learn physics at a level uh, that's not just conceptual, but is, is mathematical, that really cuts away the, the face value propaganda and gets to the, the kind of rigorous argumentation that physicists want to do is generally available to people. 
Awesome. Now, is that Sean Carroll book, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, yes, Space, Time, yes, and Motion? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the first one uh, is on space, time, and motion, and it covers relative, special relativity and general relativity, among other things. He's currently working on a follow-up uh, volume that I believe will cover quantum field theory. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, those, those things are, are now out there for people. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, uh, thank you for coming on. And again, for the audience, I've linked Dan's dissertation in the description, Cosmic Skepticism in the Beginning of the Universe. I've linked his paper a number of his papers, like the one on the modal condition for the beginning of the universe. Uh, and I've also linked my Kalam playlist, so you can check out all things Kalam. And uh, as always, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Mad Steve Reason, and peace out. <laughs>